Hello. This is a short video essay on Sam Fuller's progressive take on the Western, 40 Guns, starring Barbara Stanwyck, Barry Sullivan, and Gene Barry. It is an unusual and surprising movie with musical parts, shot in almost a music video style and incredible cinematography. And of course, it is a movie we are well prepared to analyze, having seen a good handful of representative examples so far. As per usual, please watch the film before proceeding further with this analysis. Many people don't see the Western as a vehicle for progressive values, but there is considerable evidence to the contrary, as seen in select titles of the canon, this film being one of them. Barbara Stanwyck, who was 49 when this film was shot, performed all of her own stunts and was the original Annie Oakley in George Stevens's 1935 film. The film's female heroes, and more importantly, female characters taking on masculine roles in a film, coupled with the script's moral ambiguity and anti-government critique, was Sam Fuller's and 20th Century Fox's answer to the waning popularity of the Western movie on the big screen. The declining interest in Westerns and even movie going in general was probably attributable to the ever-increasing popularity of television, which, thanks to the powerhouses like Warner Brothers and Review Productions, were competing to the box office take, with titles such as Bat Masterson, also starring Gene Barry. Barry, who was 38 years old at the time, plays one of the brothers to Griff in 40 Guns, whose short-lived marriage to the town's beauty, Lavinia, was a moment of catharsis to viewers affected both by World War II and the then-recent Korean War. In 40 Guns, the reason many viewers might find the character setup so convoluted is that there are three main factions all competing for moral and commercial superiority. The corrupt government police, the private police, and the capitalist ranchers. The way Fuller makes the political the personal, a film like 40 Guns takes a lot of its cues from European cinema, especially the films of Luis Buñuel, a filmmaker who found reciprocal respect in Fuller. With 40 Guns, we can see how genre films can be controlled and steered in such a way such that easy tropes are weaved into complex personal movies. Western genre tropes being a customary and sometimes cliched sidearm of the cinematic language was, even from the beginning, being reinvented and redefined by directors who had something to say. We will be seeing more and more big directors in this course using the genre to their own ends. At first glance, this movie seems like a standard Western. You have a classic battle of wit story of good versus evil. You have your foils, Griff and Jessica, opposed on two sides of a moral balance. Both characters play the piano. Both have a brother, Brocky and Chico respectively, who are unhinged and hungry for violence and mayhem. With all the horses and hats, you would think it was just a typical throwaway Western. But then there's the voice of Sam Fuller calling out from behind the characters. Fuller, who was known for his diverse casts and interesting female characters, used genre to voice his perspective. The anti-government view externalized here by the weakened, corrupt Marshall character is something we're going to see more and more, especially in Westerns that were made during a period of political and civil unrest. Kind of like our time today. If you study the movies of Sam Fuller, you'll realize that many of his films deal with similar themes to 40 Guns. So much that you could even say that 40 Guns isn't just a Western film. It's a Sam Fuller film. By the way, sometimes directors and writers will tackle similar themes across a genre that don't necessarily fall neatly into a category of an explicit trope. We call these themes in movies motifs, a veiled narrative statement, a dominant idea central to a particular text. From its first shot, where the camera takes on the perspective of the observer, you know that the film is going to be one that acknowledges the audience's role. The three writers, Griff, Fuller's favorite character name, and his brothers Chico and Wes roll in the town like three leisurely playboys in a convertible, not like cowboys and vigilantes, but on a wagon, which is sort of a twist to the typical Western opening. I can't for the life of me figure out why Wes and Chico aren't riding their own horses, which are being towed behind in the cart, but maybe this is just because it looks cooler. These three guys are supposed to be the ones we're rooting for, but as we'll see, they're not entirely wholesome or easy to figure out. They aren't like Train and Aaron as depicted in Veracruz. They are more ambiguous. And what's even stranger is that the lead brother Griff is hinted at having a romantic past with the other morally ambiguous character, Jessica, who is a ruthless capitalist cattle rancher. You'll probably need to rewatch the first 20 minutes twice. In addition to the movie not having any spoken dialogue for the first four minutes of its brief 80 minute running time, the characters are introduced very quickly. And Sam Fuller was one of those directors who didn't like to waste words on introductions. As a former war photographer and newspaper man, Fuller was all about shooting action and cutting to the chase right away. Fuller was also famous for his theatrics on set and on screen. How operatic is this opening? 
The soundtrack, by Harry Sukman, is like an homage to the great westerns of the 30s and 40s, and the song High Riding Woman, sung almost like a musical number by Barney Cashman, the town's resident crooning hotel manager, almost takes you out of the western and drops you into a musical. Musicals are a direct descendant of the opera. Because this film was not rated for mature audiences, you almost forget how sexually charged the movie's dialogue is. Check out this scene. Uh, I don't figure the job is my size. Could be any size you want it to be. I'm not interested in you, Mr. Bunnell. It's your trademark. May I feel it? Uh -uh. Just curious. Might go off in your face. I'll take a chance. Yeah, thanks guys, but that's not really appropriate for school. Shot in anamorphic cinemascope, the cinematography of Joseph Barak is stunning, with its day-for-night photography and epically shot tornado sequence, which is so staggeringly awesome, you almost want to assign a symbolic meaning to everything Fulda creates here, because there probably is one. It's easy to admire scenes like this. Check out that affinity of motion. The moon and the lovers juxtaposed. Fuller was Hollywood's famously economical director, a guy who shot with the budget in mind, choosing to stage very complicated, well-choreographed scenes rather than relying on a bunch of individual close-ups. You almost miss how intricate some of these set pieces are, where actors are performing complicated moves on screen in a single take. And check out this one. Look at how meaningful the visual subtext is here with Jessica's face dissolved against the prison bars in the subsequent shot. Juxtapositions are an interesting editorial technique which requires pre-planning in the shooting process to make sure that it reads. It's sort of a way of creating new meaning or association between two or more images. I guess if all of these juxtapositions and symbolism and motif hasn't made its impact, it would be from the script then that you would get Sam Fuller's real message in the film which is especially poignant considering his post-war audience and the fact that he himself was a World War II infantryman. This piece of dialogue, which is one hour into the movie, is especially deep. What's happened to us is like war. Easy to start, hard to stop. War being easy to start and hard to stop was probably a very important message for audiences to hear, seeing that this film was made four years after the Korean War. That, and the fact that Lavinia Spanger's marriage is short-lived, gives this ultra-cynical pastiche of Western cinema a unique social value in film history. If you like today's film, I highly recommend Nicholas Ray's Johnny Guitar, another 50s Western which pits two female gang leaders and their respective posse of men against each other. It stars Joan Crawford, Mercedes McCambridge from The Exorcist, and Sterling Hayden, and has a similar storyline to this movie. And if you like Sam Fuller in general, I suggest you check out the film he made next, The Crimson Kimono. Like 40 Guns, it redesigns the film noir with a progressive and modern approach. Thanks for watching.